Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Salman Abbaslan, and I'm the Deputy Director of Space Operations here at Purdue University. And welcome to the first presentation of the United States Space Force Capstone, Chapter One, The Space Domain. So as an overview, I'll be going over the attributes of orbital flight, space systems architecture, space operations, challenges of orbital flight, and feel free to email any of us at the Purdue team, uh, at the Purdue Space team, with any questions if you have any. So we'll start off with a few attributes of orbital flight, but before we get too deep into this presentation, we'll start off with a few definitions. Orbital flight is defined as the act of deliberately manipulating gravitationally curved trajectories in order to traverse beyond Earth's atmosphere and through space. An orbit is defined as any path through space an object follows based on the pull of gravity. So I'm sure many of you know about the ISS, the International Space Station, and the International Space Station is currently in orbital flight and following an orbit. Suborbital trajectories are defined as trajectories that deliberately re-enter the Earth's atmosphere before a complete circ circumnavigation. So this would largely apply to ballistic missiles, which briefly enter the space domain and fall back down into Earth to reach a location that is extremely far from its launching point. Geocentric trajectories are trajectories that remain in space for one or more revolutions around Earth. So this would also apply to missiles that need to stay, need to have a delay or need to hit a point that is farther away uh, to complete its mission. Escape trajectories are trajectories that travel beyond the geocentric regime into the gravitational topology of another celestial body. So this would largely apply to gravitational slingshots. For example, if a spacecraft is flying towards the moon, it can use the moon's gravity to change its direction uh, to a new trajectory without using any of its onboard propellant uh, exorbitantly. A spacecraft is an object that has been engineered to be controlled and deliberately employed to the space domain. All right, so I'm sure that all those definitions are pretty confusing. So here's a very intuitive video that explains everything that we just went over uh, using graphics. So contrary to what you see in movies, spacecraft can't just sit around in space near a planet because they'd fall right into it. To stay in space, we need to get into orbit. So first we take off from Earth's surface, fly up past the atmosphere and keep accelerating more and more so that we start looping around Earth before we could fall back into it. Now we're in orbit. This is where we're in zero G because even though we're still pulled downwards, we're just sort of free falling back onto our own trajectory. Now for example, to get to the moon, we need to point forward and fire our engines to expand our orbit until it intersects with the moon's path. Now even though the moon's gravity is starting to pull us in, we still need to flip around and burn our engines in reverse to slow down and get into orbit. At this point, we can pick a spot to land, burn our engines against our trajectory, and come down to the surface. Now moving into some attributes of orbital space flight. The space environment enables a range of activities that are remote, wireless, near instantaneous, and global in nature. This encompasses satellite communication, weather and surface operations, and scientific measurements, as well as many other more applications. As stated in the Space Force capstone, diminished and negligible drag creates conditions that can only be fully exploited in space. For example, if you compare a spacecraft to an aircraft, an aircraft is constantly battling atmospheric drag and form drag, as well as parasite drag, that constantly prevents its movement, requiring a constant thrust produced by the aircraft itself to remain in flight. On the flip side, a spacecraft wouldn't need any additional thrust or power to remain in orbit, as there is no additional drag preventing it. For example, the ISS orbits the Earth every 90 minutes at 15,500 miles per hour. It can do this because there is no additional drag preventing its movement. Orbital flight enables satellites to view large swaths of the globe as well as observe celestial bodies without atmospheric disrotation. So this is twofold. This enables spacecraft to cover images that cover a large surface area of the Earth's surface, as well as take pictures of other celestial bodies out in space without any dissertation from the Earth's atmosphere. 
Some more attributes of orbital flight. Space is a free enter enterprise environment, making space a domain open to all members of the international community. This means that there's limitless scientific and economic potential. But just a word of caution, this free domain could easily be dominated by one entity. And as guardians in the United States Space Force, it is our goal to ensure that space can be used by any, anyone for any scientific purpose and make sure that space remains a peaceful environment. Now moving into some space system architecture. There are three distinct segments of space system architecture. The first is the orbital segment, which encompasses spacecraft beyond Earth's atmosphere. The terrestrial segment, which is ground-based equipment used to operate spacecraft. And finally, the link segment, which are signals used to connect the orbital and terrestrial segments. All three segments are integral to space system architecture, as all three are needed for mission success. Now moving into the first dimension of space operations, the physical dimension. The physical dimension comprises of the orbital characteristics of spacecraft and the space environment. Gravity shapes the physical attributes of the space domain, which makes for a constant natural motion of objects in space. No one object in space is stagnant. Once launched into orbit, most spacecraft do not return. Mission duration is determined by transit time, range, and endurance, and it is integral for military space operations. So this is a very key point for us guardians to know, as we need to be completely sure of what we're putting up there in space and make sure that it is fully equipped to sustain itself and to make sure that it completes its mission, as once it's up there, it's most likely not going to come back down. Space is also, um, it used to be a sanctuary from attack, however, recent development of counter space capabilities made space a hostile environment. So space remain in orbit through peace and war and are constant high value targets, which is why as a part of the United States Space Force, it is our duty to protect the United States assets in space Moving into the second dimension of space operations, the cognitive dimension. The cognitive dimension encompasses the perceptions and mental processes of those who transit, transmit, and receive information to and from space. While space is a physical location, all operations are conducted through virtual stimuli. Space systems are merely the tools that extend the ability for us to perform tasks. As stated in the Space Force capstone, Space systems are not static systems. They are designed and deployed by thinking agents, which is us guardians. And lastly, the network dimension. This dimension allows us to command and control space capabilities through a physical and logical architecture that collects and transmits data around the globe. So this is largely part of cyberspace, uh, which are crucial for military operations. Nodes and links are very fundamental elements to the network dimension. Nodes are the elements of space architecture capable of creating, processing, receiving, or transmitting data. And the links are the entities that transport data between nodes. So if you picture a triangle, the nodes would be the tips of the triangle and the links would be the segments of the triangle. Now moving into some challenges of orbital flight. There are many barriers to access, movement, and recovery of spacecraft. So primarily, there are extremely high velocities that are required to attain orbit. I'm sure if you've seen any videos of a launch to orbit, you've probably seen the sheer amount of thrust and force it requires to even get the launch vehicle off of the ground, meaning that we are limited to the amount of launches we can do to orbit. Second, all spacecraft are in constant perpetual motion. S spacecraft are extremely sensitive instruments and any small change in its trajectory or attitude can result in a very drastic change in its orbit, meaning it could probably fall back into the Earth or leave the gravitational influence of the Earth. Lastly, most spacecraft remain in orbit, meaning that it is imperative a payload is fully equipped to sustain itself and to complete the mission successfully before it is sent up. There are many barriers to communications, power, and fuel. 
All ground equipment and communication equipment on the spacecraft must remain functional. If any one of these elements fail, it's an automatic mission failure. Spacecraft must be able to fully power themselves. As listed in point three of the barriers to access, movement, and recovery, spacecraft remain up in orbit for a while, and they need to be fully they need to be able to fully sustain themselves for the entire mission duration. And lastly, uh, spacecraft must launch with enough fuel to conduct all operations as well as perform any maneuvers. Changing any trajectory once a spacecraft is up in orbit is extremely costly as propellant does not come at a cheap price. And finally, some hazards of orbital flight, primarily atmospheric drag. If a satellite brushes the atmosphere of the Earth, it is already going at an extremely high rate and the additional amount of drag that can be placed on the satellite could prove to be fatal for the satellite. Uh, there's also so solar wind, which is largely uh, a hazard due to the radiation it causes. Uh, space debris is also very prevalent in orbit. And along with space debris, there are many uh, micrometeorites and many small particles in space that are moving at relatively slow velocities compared to the velocities of the spacecraft or satellite. So once these micro collisions occur on the exterior of the satellite, that collision could be compared to a gunshot. And finally, the new counter space developments by adversaries. Uh, the Space Force, as the Space Force, it is our goal to ensure that space remains a peaceful environment and to protect the assets of the United States up there in space. So as a summary, I went over the attributes of orbital flight, space systems architecture, space operations, challenges of orbital flight, hazards of orbital flight, and please feel free to email any of us at Purdue if you have any questions. Thank you.